on that. It was that bad that many rumblings among our prisoners, the world come to an end. Where were your thoughts then? Didn't make any difference. They didn't have any thoughts. It didn't make any difference to us at that stage of the game. Whether I lived or died, it didn't make that much difference. It's a fact. We're better off dead than we were living the way we were living anyway. For the Japanese, too, the only relief was offered in death. 70,000 people were killed in an instant. Just as many more horribly burned or wounded, many would die later of radiation sickness. John Ford was left in turmoil. Freedom was at hand, but his humanity badly shaken. On Little Island we were on, they had a hospital there and they bought some of the burned people and put them in this hospital and Reg it, it was break your heart to see them they're just like a piece of beef burnt so badly and screeching and hollering there's no way in the world they were burnt right to nothing the final act of surrender takes place on the US warship Missouri in the weeks that follow, John Ford is liberated and returns to Newfoundland and Margaret. He had changed an awful lot. He was very thin, and he wasn't the same Jack then as I knew when he went away, you know. They marry and live a quiet life. Now, over half a century later, John Ford prepares to return to Nagasaki. That's one of my grandsons told me the other day. He said, Pop, you sure wear that to Japan? Margaret was pleased for me to go. I talked over with her on many occasions. She said, you go. This trip will not be easy. This life has many scars. But redemption calls to him, and his comrades call to him too. Nagasaki today, in my opinion, is a much different place. To think that I've came here many years ago, and I had no idea in this world that I ever come back here. As a matter of fact, as we went out to the arbor, we said goodbye Nagasaki, we never want to see you again. The airship, that's gone, but the memory is still there. Two days later, Sunday morning. But this one was not there in my day, not that, like a passive. John Ford is doing something he's never done before. He's driving to the site of his former prison camp. Just after 11, we find the site. I'd say it's quite a coincidence that we arrived here about two minutes after 11, and the clock says that, yep. and it's just that number of years ago, two minutes past 11, 1945, August the 9th, that we witnessed the same, a very, very desperate situation, really. Shall we go inside? <laughs> Let's go over this way. We're, we're allowed in The school? gate is open for us there. Okay, good. There is no sign no indication of what this place was. Today, a junior high school is located on the ground. But what happened here still washes over John Ford. Every step, another flashback of tortured memories. Not one of these boys, not one of them wanted to die. They were all individuals in their 20s, 21, 22, 23. They didn't want to die. They wanted to live. It's rather sad to know that they had to go in this way, really, in such a place so far from home. And I think they always realized and often said to themselves, what are we doing here? May their souls rest in peace. Across the city, a man is waiting. 
one John Ford has asked to meet. His name is Mr. Koichi Wada. He is the first Japanese victim of the Nagasaki bombing that John Ford has ever spoken with. Welcome to Nagasaki. Uh, thank My you. Name, Arigato. Arigato. Thank you. Brian Burke Gaffney, a Canadian living in Nagasaki, will act as interpreter. Koichi Wada has gone through some hardships of his own. In August 1945, he was a very young student. To avoid military service, he said he was colorblind. Instead, he was put to work as a Nagasaki streetcar operator. He was just about to take a break on August the 9th, 1945. I was trapped in the debris for some time. I came to my senses and managed to escape from the debris and went out. And when I went out onto the road, I looked and I first thing I said to myself is, where did the city of Nagasaki go? It was a terrible situation and you saw a little more than I did about the burnt bodies, but I saw enough to convince me I never want to see it again. Two men, two cultures, two worlds, bonded in death and destruction, now bonded in peace. The evening is spent on the water. I was working this dockyard the day they dropped the bomb. Japanese businessmen celebrate on board, unaware who one of their fellow passengers is or why he is here. He knows what he's looking for, and just before dusk, he finds here, it. To me, to me, there's where the bomb dropped, straight, straight ahead of me there, right in that valley. Yes. And I saw the old thing as it, as it happened. And the fact that they, the hills were there protected somewhat, and everything blackened out after that. But right in that valley is where it happened. How do you feel being here right now looking at this? Oh, oh, <laughs> difficult. Difficult. But one, not one can do much about it, but it's very difficult to see that happen like it did. Very unfortunate. Now every year he also remembers the victims of Nagasaki, along with his fallen comrades. Some people often said to me, the war is over a long time ago. The war is never over for me. It's never been over for me. They were a young man, 22, 23 years of age. They didn't want to die. They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. And in November, on Remembrance Day, we will remember them. And that is News and Review. Don't forget to check out our website at newsandreview.cbclearning.ca. I'm Michael Serapio. Thanks for watching.